End-tidal CO2 monitoring is common in the ICU and used on virtually every intubated patient. It's often used as a surrogate for arterial CO2 because it correlates well and can be continuously monitored. However, that good correlation can disappear in patients with congenital heart disease, particularly those with single ventricle physiology. Those of us that work in the pediatric cardiac ICU have to think about this when we're deciding how to respond to abnormal end-tidal CO2 readings. So let's talk about why end-tidal carbon dioxide and arterial carbon dioxide measurements aren't the same in congenital heart disease. First, we need to understand end-tidal CO2 in normal physiology. So let's assume a two-ventricle heart with no shunts and normal, healthy lungs. If we focus in on the alveoli, deep in the lungs where gas exchange occurs, we'll see that the partial pressure of CO2 in the air in the alveoli is about 40 millimeters of mercury. The blood passing by the alveoli in the capillaries will have a CO2 above this, in this case 45. Exchange of CO2 between the blood and the air in the alveoli is quick and complete. So by the time the blood is leaving the capillaries, the CO2 in the blood is equilibrated to 40. This blood returns to the heart via the pulmonary veins, then exits the heart to supply the body with oxygen. The body extracts the oxygen and releases CO2 that was generated by cellular metabolism back into the blood. This is carried back to the heart and then back to the lungs via the pulmonary artery to start the whole process again. The end tidal CO2 monitor displays the highest concentration of CO2 that exits the lungs. But even in healthy lungs and healthy hearts, the end tidal CO2 is going to be lower than the arterial CO2. So if the CO2 in the alveoli is 40, why isn't that what we breathe out? It's because of this, anatomic dead space. This is the portion of the lungs, the conducting airways, the air goes into, but does not participate in gas exchange. The air here has the same CO2 concentration as the atmosphere, which is very low. This mixes with the air coming from the alveoli, lowering the CO2 concentration exiting the lungs, resulting in an end tidal CO2 that is lower than the arterial CO2. In normal circumstances, the differences between end tidal CO2 and arterial CO2 is a couple of points. And so end tidal CO2 can be used to monitor a patient's ventilation in the ICU. But that's not the case in many of our patients with congenital heart disease. There are three potential reasons that the CO2 difference is elevated in our patients. Number one, right to left shunt. Remember the venous blood is desaturated and has a higher CO2 as it returns to the heart. If the patient has a total mixing lesion or any kind of right to left shunt, a portion of that venous blood will bypass the lungs and go straight to the arterial circulation, raising the arterial CO2 and lowering the saturation, while the end tidal CO2 stays the same. There's an equation that we can use to predict what the CO2 difference should be. What's important to us is this part right here, 100 minus the arterial saturation. So as saturation goes down, reflected as a greater right to left shunt, the CO2 difference gets bigger. But a nice study by Dr. Short and friends showed that when using this equation, the predicted CO2 difference was almost always less than the actual measured difference. So there has to be more going on. So reason number two is exacerbated VQ mismatch from pulmonary hypoperfusion. Ideally, the ratio of blood flow to the lungs and blood flow to the body from the heart is one to one. This is the QP to QS ratio. The ventilation to perfusion ratio, abbreviated VQ, is the ratio of air that reaches the alveoli and blood that makes it to the pulmonary capillaries. In a perfectly efficient cardiorespiratory system, there would be just enough ventilation to fully saturate the blood, so no effort is wasted. A ventilation to perfusion ratio close to 1 to 1. In reality, the ratio is closer to 0.8 to 1. Decreased pulmonary blood flow is common in congenital heart disease, either due to an increased right to left shunt or obstruction to pulmonary blood flow. So now air is going into the lungs, but not picking up as much CO2 from the blood because there's less blood to pick it up from. This is ventilation to perfusion mismatch. The air exiting the lungs has a lower CO2, so the end tidal CO2 is lower and the end tidal to arterial CO2 gradient is increased. Reason number one and number two make sense for children with cyanotic heart disease, but a study by Dr. Chandri and friends demonstrated that children with large left to right shunts, such as ventricular septal defects, which do not result in cyanosis and have high pulmonary blood flow, also have an increased end tidal to arterial CO2 difference. So that brings us to a possible reason number three, pulmonary congestion. High pulmonary blood flow leads to vascular congestion and pulmonary edema. This causes alveolar dead space. Air is getting into the alveoli, but its ability to participate in gas exchange is limited due to the congestion in the surrounding tissues. The air leaves the lung, having picked up less CO2 than it otherwise would have, and so the end tidal CO2 is lower, and the end tidal to arterial CO2 difference is higher. The moral of the story is don't trust the end tidal CO2 to tell you what the arterial CO2 is in the cardiac ICO.
it will always be lower, sometimes by a lot. But don't get rid of it, because no entitled CO2 is usually bad.